Act 1, Scene 1, A Room in Lovelace's Lodging in London. <sighs> How true is that philosophy which says, our heaven is seated in our minds. <laughs> Through all the roving pleasures of my youth, I never knew one moment's peace like this. Here, in this little soft retreat, my thoughts unbent from all the cares of life, content with fortune, eased from the grating duties of dependence, from envy free, ambition underfoot, the raging flame of wild, destructive lust, reduced to a warm, pleasing fire of lawful love. My life glides on, and all is well within. Enter Amanda. How does the happy cause of my content, my dear Amanda? You find me musing on my happy state and full of grateful thoughts to heaven and you. Those grateful offerings heaven can't receive with more delight than I do. Would I could share with it as well the dispensations of its bliss that I might search its choicest favors out and shower them on your head forever. The largest boons that heaven thinks fit to grant to things it has decreed shall crawl on earth are in the gift of woman formed like you. Perhaps when time shall be no more, when the aspiring soul shall take its flight and drop this ponderous lump of clay behind it, it may have appetites we know not of. But till that day of knowledge shall instruct me, the utmost blessing that my thought can reach is folded in mine arms and rooted in my heart. There, let it grow forever. Well said, Amanda. Let it be forever. Would heaven grant that? Were all the heaven I'd ask. But we are clad in black mortality and the dark curtain of eternal night at last must drop between us. It must. That mournful separation we must see. A bitter pill it is to all, but doubles its ungrateful taste when lovers are to swallow it. Perhaps that pain may only be my lot. You, possibly, may be exempted from it. Men find out softer ways to quench their fires. Can you then doubt my constancy, Amanda? You'll find tis built upon a steady basis. The rock of reason now supports my love which the rudest hurricane of wild desire could, like the breath of a soft slumbering babe, pass by and never shake it. Yet, still tis safer to avoid the storm. The strongest vessels, if they put to sea, may possibly be lost. Would I could keep you here in this calm port forever. Forgive the weakness of a woman. I am uneasy at your going to stay so long in town. I know its false insinuating pleasures. I know the strength of its attacks. I know the weak defense of nature. I know you are a man and I a wife. You know then all that needs to give you rest. For wife's the strongest claim that you can urge. Therefore, be calm. Banish your fears, for they are traitors to your peace. You know my business is indispensable that obliges me to go to London. And you have no reason that I know of to believe that I'm glad of the occasion, for my honest conscience is my witness. I have found such charms in my retirement here with you that I have never thrown one roving thought that way. My former boon companions of the bottle may fairly try what charms are left in wine, sing praises to their God and drink his glory, turn wild enthusiasts for his sake and beasts to do him honor, whilst I, stubborn atheist, sullenly look on without one reverend glass to his divinity, accept of this for proof of my temperance. Then for my constancy, I there take heed. Indeed, the danger is small. And yet my fears are great. Why are you so timorous? Because you are so bold. My courage should disperse your apprehensions. My apprehensions should alarm your courage. Fie, fie, Amanda. It is not kind thus to distrust me. And yet my fears are founded on my love. For if you can believe tis possible, I should again relapse to my past follies. No more. It would be a weakness in my tongue if I should press you farther with my fears. 
I'll therefore trouble you no longer with them. Nor shall they trouble you much longer. A little time shall show you they were groundless. This winter shall be the fiery trial of my virtue, which when it once has passed, you'll be convinced twas of no false allay. There, all your cares will end. Pray heaven they may. Exeunt Lovelace and Amanda, hand in hand. Scene two, Whitehall. Enter young fashion, his valet Laurie, and a waterman. Can, come, pay the waterman and take the suitcase. Faith, sir, I think the waterman had as good take the suitcase and pay himself. Oh, I'm sure there's something left in it. Mm, but one solitary old waistcoat upon my honor, sir. Why, what's become of the blue coat, sir? Sir, it was eaten at Gravesend. The reckoning came to 30 shillings, and your privy purse was worth but two half crowns. Mm, it is very well. Don't let him keep the suitcase that we might keep our crowns, and they're an end. I can afford no better. Exit the waterman. So now, sir, I hope you'll own yourself a happy man. You have outlived all your cares. How so, sir? Why, you have nothing left to take care of. Yes, sir, I have myself and you to take care of still. Sir, if you could but prevail with somebody else to do that for you, I fancy we might both fare the better for it. Why, if thou canst tell me where to apply myself, I have at present so little money and so much humility about me that I may follow a fool's advice. Why then, sir, your fool advises you to lay aside all animosity and apply to Sir Novelty, your elder brother. To him, my elder brother. Oh, with all my heart, but get him to redeem your annuity first. My annuity? Stead, my brother's such a dog, he would not give his powder puff to redeem my immortal soul. Look you, sir, you must wheedle him or you must starve. Look you, sir, I will neither wheedle him nor starve. Why? What will you do then? I'll go into the army. <laughs> you can't take the oaths, you are a Jacobite. Thou mayst as well say I can't take orders because I'm an atheist. <sighs> Sir, your brother has money. And idiocy to spare. Art thou so impregnable a blockhead to believe he'll help me with a farthing? Not if you treat him as you used to do. Why, how wouldst thou have me treat him? Like a trout. Tickle him. I can't flatter. Can you starve? Yes. I can't. Goodbye to you, Mr. Fashion. Say, sir, thou wilt distract me. What, what wouldst thou have me to say to him? Oh, say nothing to him. Apply yourself to his favorites, compliment his periwig, his cravat, his feather, his snuff box, and when you are well with them, desire him to lend you a thousand pounds. I'll engage you prosper. Death and furies. Why does that cost come thrust into the world before me? Oh, fortune, fortune, thou art a bitch by God. Exeunt. Scene three. A dressing room in Lord Foppington's house. Enter Lord Foppington in his nightgown and a uh, page severally. A uh, page? Sir. Sir? Pray, sir, do me the favor to teach your tongue the title the king has thought fit to honor me with? Oh, my lord, I ask your lordship's pardon. My lord. Very good. You can pronounce the word then. I thought it would have choked you. Uh, call my valet. I would dress. Exit the page. Well, tis an unspeakable pleasure to be a man of quality. Strike me dumb, my lord, your lordship, my lord Foppington. Why, the ladies are ready to puke at me whilst I had nothing but Sir Novelty to recommend me to him. Uh, sure, whilst I was but a knight, I was a very nauseous fellow. Well, Tis ten thousand pound well spent. Stop my vitals. Enter Leverol. My lord, the shoemaker, the tailor, the hosier, and the seamstress be all ready, if your lordship please to dress. Uh, Tis well, admit him. Hey, peasants! Enter! Re-enter the page with a shoemaker, a tailor, a hosier, and a seamstress. So... Gentlemen, I hope you have all taken pains to show yourselves masters in your professions. I think I may presume to say, sir. My lord, you clown, you. 
Why, is Sir Novelty made a lord? He is purchased a lord, sir, and very dearly. Oh, my lord, I, I ask your lordship's pardon. I have brought your lordship as accomplished a suit of clothes as ever peer of England trod the stage in, my lord. Will your lordship please to try him now? Aye, uh, but, but let my people arrange the mirrors that I may see myself before and behind, for I love to see myself all round. Whilst Foppington puts on his clothes, enter Fashion and Laurie. Hey, Day, what the devil have we here? How many servants does it take to dress a grown man? As many as he can afford, sir, which is why you have only me. Death and eternal tortures, sir. I say the pocket's too high by a foot. My lord, if it had been an inch lower, it would not have held your lordship's pocket handkerchief. Brought my pocket handkerchief. Have not I a page to carry it? Tis not for me to dispute your lordship's fancy. His lordship. Lori, did you observe that? Your brother has grown very fine. My brother has ruined his estate by a title and has grown into nothing but an ass. But let's accost him. Brother, I am your humble servant. Oh, Lord, Tom, I did not expect you in England. Uh, look you, Taylor, I shall never be reconciled to this nauseous pocket. It is entirely too high. Uh, therefore, pray, get me another suit with all manners of expedition, lest I personally hang you from the ceiling. For this beruffled catastrophe is my eternal aversion. Away, you scraps! Well, Laurie, what do you think on it? A very friendly reception from a brother after three years' absence. Remember your office, Mr. Fashion, sir. You may never have another opportunity. <clears throat> ah, now that your people of business are gone, brother, I hope I may obtain a quarter of an hour's audience of you. Faith! Tom, I must beg you'll excuse me at this time, for I must away to the House of Lords immediately. My Lady Teaser's case has come in today, and I would not be absent for the salvation of mankind. <laughs> hey, Paige, uh, is the coach at the door? Uh, yes, my lord. You'll excuse me, brother. Shall you be back at dinner? As God shall judge me, I can't tell, for it is possible I may dine with some of my fellow peers at Lockett's. Shall I meet you there, for I must needs talk with you. That, I'm afraid, may not be so proper, for the lords I commonly eat with are a uh, people of uh, nice conversation. And you, you know, Tom, your education has been a little at large. Uh, but, but if you'll stay here, you may dine with my footmen. Uh, hey, Paige, uh, what is there for dinner? Uh, uh, there's beef. I suppose my brother will eat beef. Dear Tom, I am glad to see thee in England. Stop my vitals. Exeunt Foppington with his equipage. Hell and furies, is this to be born? Faith, sir, I could almost have given him a knock of the pate myself. It is enough. I, I will now show you the excess of my passion by being very calm. Tom Laurie, lay your loggerhead to mine. In cool blood, let us contrive his destruction. Oh, here comes a head, sir, would contrive it better than us both if he would but join in the Confederacy. Enter Coupler. By this light, old Coupler, why how now, matchmaker, art thou here still to plague the world with matrimony? You old bod, how have you the impudence to be hobbling out of your grave 20 years after you were rotten? Oh, when you begin to rot, sir, you'll go off like a pippin. One winter shall send you to the devil. Yeah, but, but on my conscience, Tom, I thought you had been abroad of late, squandering your Cambridge education in the streets of Italy. What mischief brings you home to London again? Poverty, sir, the cause of all shameful retreats. Well, come, I'm still a friend to thy person, though I have contempt of thy understanding, and therefore I would willingly know thy condition, that I may see whether thou standst in need of my assistance. I stand in need of anybody's assistance that will help me cut my elder brother's throat without risk of being hanged for it. Egad, Sarah, well, I could help thee to do him almost as good a turn and without any danger at all. Sayst thou so, old Satan? Show me but that, and my soul is thine. I, but hold, who's that? 
If we are heard, we are undone. What, have you forgot Lori? Oh, trusty Lori. Oh, is it thee? Oh, give me thy hand, old boy. Oh, I remember thy honesty, though not thy face. It's not half worth remembering, sir. Oh, well, <laughs> now, Ithashian, you must know I have done you the kindness to make up a match for your brother. And I meant to be grateful to you. You may be, Sarah, for the lady is a great heiress. 1,500 pounds a year and a great bag of money. And the match is concluded, the writings are drawn, and the pipkins to be cracked in a fortnight. Now, you must know, Stripling, with respect to your mother, <laughs> your brother's the son of a whore. Good. Uh, he has given me a bond of a thousand pounds for helping him to this fortune, and he has promised me as much more upon the day of marriage, but I have lately been made to understand by a friend that your brother never designs to pay me. Shocking. Mm, well, if, therefore, you will be a generous young dog, Fashion, and secure me 5,000 pounds, I'll be a covetous old rogue and help you to the lady. God, if thou canst bring this about, I'll have thy statue cast in bronze. <laughs> now, yes. Now, this plump partridge that I tell you of lives in the country 50 miles off with her honored father in a lonely old house which nobody comes near. Oh, she never goes abroad, nor sees company at home. To prevent all misfortunes, she has her her breeding within doors. The parson of the parish teaches her to play on the bass viola, the clerk to sing, her nurse to dress, and her father to dance. In short, nobody can give you admittance there but I. Nor can I do it any other way than by making you pass for your brother. And how the devil wilt thou do that? Oh, well, without the devil's aid, I warrant thee. Now, Thy brother's face, not one of her family ever saw. Now, Fashion, you must go to them directly, dressed in a fine habit, proclaim to Sir Tunbelly Clumsy, for that's the gentleman's name, that you are the lord that is to marry his daughter. Fall desperately in love with the wench as soon as you see her. Make that your plea for marrying her immediately. And when the fatigue of the wedding night's over, you shall send me a swinging purse of the lady's gold, you dog, you. He can, Coupler. If I had not this matrimonial arrangement dropped at my feet, by heavens, I'd marry thee. Oh, well, oh, Sarah. Now, be at my lodgings in half an hour, and I'll equip you all the finest clothes I have and a passport in your brother's name. <laughs> Adieu, my young charmer. Adieu, my old lecher. <laughs> Exit Coupler. So, Lori, in Providence, thou seest at last takes care of men of merit. We are in a fair way to be great people. I serve for the which I could sing for joy. And yet. Oh, no. What wouldst thou say if a qualm of conscience should spoil my design? I would say nothing, but I would strangle you. Why, Faith Lori, though I am a young rake hell, I have played many a roguish trick upon a lady. This design is so full flourish to cheat, I find I must take pains to come up to it. I have scruples. They're strong symptoms of death. If your hesitations multiply, sir, you must needs draw up your will. We have not the money to continue breathing air. Then thus far I'll hearken to it. Before I execute this project. I'll try my brother once more with all the deference and modesty of a philosopher, and if he has yet so much humanity about him as to assist me, I'll drop my stratagem at his feet in exchange for some reasonable funds and let him marry the cloistered heiress. This one conclusive trial of him I resolve to make. Succeed or no, still victory is my lot if I subdue his heart. Tis well, if not, I shall subdue my conscience to the pot. End of Act 1. Act 2. Scene 1. A room in London. Enter Lovelace and Amanda. How do you like these lodgings, my dear? 
For my part, I am so well pleased with them. I, I shall hardly remove whilst we stay in town, if you are satisfied. I am satisfied with everything that pleases you, else I have not come to town at all. Oh, a little of the noise and bustle of the world sweetens the pleasures of retreat. We shall find the charms of our retirement doubled when we return to it. That pleasing prospect will be my chiefest entertainment. Whilst much against my will, I am obliged to stand surrounded with these empty London pleasures, which tis so much the fashion to be fond of. I own most of them are indeed but empty. Yet there are delights of which a private life is destitute, which may divert an honest man and, and be a harmless entertainment to a virtuous woman. The conversation of the town is one, and the plays, I think, may be esteemed another. Last night, there happened one that moved me strangely. Pray, what was that? Why, it was about... Ah, but tis not repeating. Yes, pray, let me know it. No, I think tis as well let alone. Nay, now you make me have a mind to know. Oh, it was a foolish thing. You'd perhaps grow jealous, should I tell it to you. I shall begin to think I have cause if you persist in making it a secret. I'll then convince you you have none by making it no longer so. Know then, I happened in the play to find my very character, only with the addition of a relapse, which struck me so I ceased watching it immediately. And to divert myself from the stage, I set myself to admire the workmanship of nature in the face of a young lady that sat some distance from me. She was so exquisitely handsome. So exquisitely handsome. Why do you repeat my words, my dear? Because you seem to speak them with such pleasure, I thought I might oblige you with their echo. <laughs> then uh, you are alarmed, Amanda. It is my duty to be so when you are in danger. You are too quick in apprehending for me. All will be well when you have heard me out. I do confess I gazed upon her. Nay, eagerly I gazed upon her. Eagerly? That's with desire. No, I desired her not. I viewed her with a world of admiration, but not one glance of love. Take heed of trusting to such nice distinctions. Who was she, pray? Indeed, I cannot tell. You will not tell. By all that sacred love, I did not ask. Nay, why do you sigh? I hope you are not disturbed. Have I not cause? None, certainly. God, if you were to come home and tell me you had seen a handsome man, should I grow jealous because you had eyes? But should, but should I tell you he were exquisitely so, that I had gazed on him with admiration, that I looked with eager eyes upon him, should you not think twere possible I might go one step further and inquire his name? She has reason on her side. I have talked too much and must turn us another way. Hark you, madam, here comes our footman, stern with purpose. I don't doubt, but he bears news of a friendly visitation. Enter a footman. Madam, there's a young lady at the door in a chair desires to know whether your ladyship sees company. I think her name is Berinthia. Berinthia, my cousin. I have not seen her these five years. Pray, let her walk in. Exit the footman. Here's another beauty for you, husband. She was young when I saw her last, but I hear she's grown extremely handsome. <laughs> Fear me not. Enter Berinthia. Upon seeing her, Loveless starts. How? Oh, by heavens, the very woman from last night. Just Amanda, I did not expect to meet with you in town. Sweet cousin, dear Berinthia, I am overjoyed to see you. Mr. Loveless, here's a relation and a friend of mine whom I desire you'll be better acquainted with. If my, if my wife never desires a harder thing, madam, her request will be easily granted. I think, madam, I ought to wish you joy. Joy? Upon what? Upon your marriage. You were a widow when I last saw you. 
You ought rather, madam, to wish me joy upon that, since I am the only gainer. If Amanda has got so good a husband as the world reports, she has gained enough to expect the compliment of her friends upon it. Re-enter the footman. Sir, my Lord Foppington presents his humble service to you and desires to know how you do. He but just now heard you were in town. Foppington? I know him not. Not his dignity, perhaps, but you do his person. Tis Sir Novelty fashion. He has brought a barony in order to marry a great fortune and has already sent cards to all the town to make him acquainted with his new title. Give my service to his lordship and let him know I am proud of the honor he intends me. Exit the footman. Sure, this addition of quality must have so improved this coxcomb. It'll be very good company for a quarter of an hour. Now it moves my pity more than my mirth to see a man whom nature has made no fool strive so industriously to pass for an ass. <laughs> no, there you are too compassionate, Amanda. Pity those whom nature abuses, but never those who abuse nature. Besides, the town would be robbed of one of its chiefest diversions if it should be a crime to laugh at a fool. <laughs> Here he comes. Enter Lord Foppington. Sir, I am your most humble servant. I wish you joy, my lord. Oh, lord, sir. Madam, your ladyship's welcome to town. I wish your lordship joy. Oh, heavens, madam. My lord, this young lady is a relation of my wife's. The beautifulest race of people upon earth, I am sure. Uh, dear Loveless, I am overjoyed to see you have brought your family to town again. Stop my vitals. Uh, for I design to lie with your wife. For God's sake, Mrs. Amanda, how has your ladyship been able to subsist thus long under the fatigue of a country life? My life has been very far from that, my lord. It has been a very quiet one. Why, that's the fatigue I speak of, madam, for tis impossible to be quiet without uh, thinking. Now, thinking is to me the greatest fatigue in the world. Does your lordship not love reading, then? Oh, passionately, madam, but I never think of what I read. Why, your lordship can read without thinking. Can your ladyship pray without devotion? Huh. <laughs> well, I must own, I think, books the best entertainment in the world. Indeed, I am so much of your ladyship's mind, madam, that I have a private gallery where I walk sometimes, furnished with nothing but books and mirrors. Madam, I have gilded them and ranged them so prettily before God, it is the most entertaining thing in the world to walk and look upon him. Nay, I love a neat library too, but tis I think the inside of a book should be recommended most. Mm, that, I must confess, I am not altogether so fond of. For, to my mind, the inside of a book is to entertain oneself with the forced product of another man's brain. But I think a man of quality and breeding ought predominantly to be occupied with the natural sprouts of his own. But to say the truth, madam, though a man may love reading never so well, I believe that when once he comes to know this town, he finds so many better ways of passing away the four and twenty hours than for ten thousand pities he should consume his time in mere ages. Uh, for example, Mrs. Lovelace, uh, my life in London is a, a perpetual stream of pleasure. I rise, madam, about 10 o'clock. I don't rise sooner because tis the worst thing in the world for the complexion. Uh, so at 10 o'clock, I say I, I rise. Now, now, if I find it a good day, I resolve to take a turn in the park and see all the fine women. So I huddle in my clothes and get dressed by one. If it be nasty weather, I take a turn in the chocolate house, where as you walk, madam, you have the prettiest prospect in the world, mirrors all around you. I, but I'm afraid I tire the company. Not at all. Pray, go on. But my lord, you those spend a great deal of your time in intrigues. You have given us no account of them yet. Mm, so she would acquire into my amour. That's jealousy. She begins to be in love with me. Why, madam, as to my time for my intrigues, 
I never give more than half an hour to a rendezvous so that the course of my other pleasures is not very much interrupted. But your lordship now has become a pillar of the state. You must attend the weighty affairs of the nation. Sir, as to weighty affairs, I leave them to weighty heads. I never intend mine shall be a burden to my body. Pray, which church does your lordship most oblige with your presence on Sundays? Oh, St. James's, madam. There's much the best company. Is there good preaching, too? Why, faith, madam, I, I can't tell. A man must have very little to do there that can give an account of the sermon. You must give us an account of the ladies, at least. Or I deserve to be excommunicated. Uh, there is... My Lady Tattle, my Lady Prate, my Lady Titter, my Lady Lear, my Lady Giggle, and my Lady Grin. Uh, these fits in front of the boxes and are the prettiest company in the world. Stop my vitals. Uh, might we hope for the honor to see your ladyship added to our society, madam? Alas, my lord, I am the worst company in the world at church, for I am apt to listen to the prayers and the sermon. Oh, no, I, I shall break you of that habit. And I hope, madam, at one time or other, I shall have the honor to lead your ladyship to your coach there. Methinks she seems strangely pleased with everything I say to her. It is a vast pleasure to receive encouragement from a woman before her husband's face. Ladies, I'll take my leave. I am afraid I begin to grow troublesome with the length of my visit. Your lordship is too entertaining to grow troublesome anywhere. That's as much as to say she wishes to lie with me. I'll let her see I'm quick of apprehension. Oh, lord, madam, I, I nearly forgot. There is a secret I must needs tell your ladyship. Uh, Ned, you must not be so jealous now as to listen. Not I, my lord. I'm too fashionable a husband to pry into the secrets of my wife. Buffington <laughs> pulls Amanda aside. I am in love with you to desperation. Strike me speechless. Then thus I return your passion, you impudent fool. Amanda gives Foppington a box of the ears. God's curse, madam. I am a peer of the realm. Is that an excuse or an explanation? Hey, what the devil? Do you affront my wife, sir? Nay, then. Loveless draws his sword and begins to duel with Foppington. Amanda runs, shrieking for help as Berinthia laughs. Ah! What has my folly done? Help! Murder! Help! Pardon, for God's sake! Loveless stabs Foppington in the stomach. Ah! Quite through the body. Stop. My vitals. Ugh. I hope I didn't kill the fool. Bear him up! Where's your wound, sir? Just through the guts. Call a surgeon there! Unbutton him quickly. I pray make haste. It would be highly dissatisfactory for a man of my stature to perish on so unfashionable a couch. Re-enter the footman with Dr. Syringe. Here's Mr. Syringe, sir. He just going by the door. He's the welcomest man alive. Stand by, stand by, stand by. Pray, gentlemen, stand by. Lord, have mercy upon us. Why do you stand gawking so? Did you never see a man run through the body before? Stand by, I say. Ah, uh, Mr. Syringe, I'm a dead man. You are a brave man, your lordship, and tis my honor to attend you. Privy, don't stand prating, but look upon his wound. Why? What if I don't? What? Why, then he'll bleed to death, sir. Why, then I'll fetch him to life again, sir. This life, he's run through the guts, sir. Uh, would he were run through the heart. I should get more credit by his cure. Look at the wound, Sirrah! Syringe examines Foppington's wound and gasps dramatically. <gasps> Garzooms, what a gash is here. Why, sir, a man may drive a coach and six horse into your body. The hole is so large. Thank you. Why, what the devil, Loveless? Have you run the gentleman through with a scythe? Zunes, what fools are here? Tis but a little prick between the skin and the ribs, that's all. Let me see the wound. Then you must dress it, sir, for if anybody looks upon the wound, I won't. What? Thou art the veriest coxcomb I ever saw. Sir, I am not master of my trade for nothing. Surgeon! My lord? Is there any hopes? Hopes? 
I can't tell. What are you willing to give for your cure? 500 pounds, with pleasure. Why then, perhaps there may be hoax. Unbelievable. But we must avoid further delay. Here, help the gentleman into a chair and carry him to my house presently. That's the properest place to bubble him out of his money. <laughs> Come, a chair, a chair, quickly there in with him. The footman puts Foppington into a chair. D dear Lovelace, adieu. If, if I die, I forgive thee. And, and if I live, I, I hope thou wilt do as much by me. Carry him off, Sira. Tis time for me to work a miracle. Exeunt syringe and the footman bearing Foppington. Now, my dear, let me ask your pardon for my indiscretion. I ought not to have struck him. No, there's no harm done. You served him well. For heaven's sake, cuz, what was it he did to you? Oh, nothing. He only squeezed me kindly by the hand and frankly offered me a coxcomb's heart. It was very well done, and I salute thee. Enter Worthy. Save you, save you, good people. I'm glad to find you all alive. I met a wounded peer carrying off. What in God's name was the matter? Oh, a trifle, Mr. Worthy. He would have lain with my wife before my face. So she obliged him with a box of the ear, and I ran him through the body. That's all. Bagatelle on all sides. But pray, madam, how long has this noble lord been an admirer of yours? This is the first I have heard of it. And I suppose tis more his quality than his love, which has brought him to it. He thinks his new title an authentic passport to every woman's heart below the degree of a countess. He's foolish enough to think anything. But I hope there's no danger of his life. None at all. Oh, he's fallen into the hands of a rascally surgeon who I perceive designs to frighten a little money out of him. But I saw his wound. It is nothing. Well, then, sir, if these ladies have no further service for you, perhaps you'll oblige me if you can go to the place I spoke to you of the other day. With all my heart, though I could wish, methinks, to stay and gaze a little longer on that creature, Berinthia. Good God, how beautiful she is. But what have I to do with beauty? I have already had my portion and must not covet more. Uh, come, sir, when you please. Ladies, your servant. Mr. Lovelace, pray one word with you before you go. Uh, what would, my dear? Only a woman's foolish question. How do you like my cousin here? <laughs> Jealous already, Amanda. Not at all. I ask you for another reason. Well, whatever her reason must be, I must not tell her the truth. Why then, I confess she's handsome. But you must not think I slight your kinswoman if I own to you that she is the last would triumph in my heart. I'm satisfied. Now tell me why you asked. At night, I will. Adieu. I'm yours. Loveless kisses Amanda, Exe and Loveless and Worthy. I'm glad to find he does not like her, for I have a great mind to persuade her to come and live with me. Now, Berinthia, let me inquire a little into your affairs, for truly I am enough your friend to care about everything that concerns you. Alas, cousin, I am sorry I have no secrets to trust with you, for I would not have you think I doubt your solidarity. Why is it possible that one so young and beautiful as you should live and have no secrets? What secrets do you mean? Lovers. Oh, I have 20 of those, but there's not one secret one amongst them. Lovers in this age have too much honor to do anything underhand. They do all above board, which is why a woman ought to have several. There is not one of my half score lovers but he fragrantly flagrantly follows half a score of mistresses now their affections being divided among so many are not strong enough for anyone least of all me yet these london gallants seem to have a torrent of love to dispose of why but tis like the river of a modern philosopher it sets out with a violent stream splits in a thousand branches and is all lost in the sands but 
Prithee, Perinthia, instruct me a little farther, for I am so great a novice, I'm almost ashamed on it. My husband's leaving me whilst I was young and fond threw me into such a depth of discontent that ever since I have led a private and reclusive life, which renders me appallingly ignorant. I have no desire to commit an intrigue myself, but I would fain hear how they play out for other women. The practical part of all unlawful love is... Huh, it's abominable. But for the speculative part of infidelity is most entertaining. The conversation of all the virtuous women in the town turns upon that, as well as new clothes. Pray, cuz, dost think those women we call ladies of reputation do really escape all other men as they do those shadows of them, the bow? Oh, no, Amanda. There are a sort of men make dreadful works amongst them, men that may, may be called the bow's antipathy, for they agree in nothing but walking upon two legs. These men have brains, the bow has none. These are in love with their mistress, the bow with himself. They are decent, he's a fop. They are sound, he's rotten. They are men, he's an ass. If this be their character, I fancy we had here a pattern of them both. Lord Foppington and Mr. Worthy, you mean? The same. As for the Lord, he's eminently so. And for the other, I can assure you, there's not a man in town who has a better interest with the women who, that are worth gossiping about. But Worthy keeps it all private, like a backstair minister at court. He answers then the opinion I ever had of him. <laughs> Heavens! What a difference there is between a discreet man like Worthy and that vain, nauseous, fops or novelty. I must acquaint you with a secret, cousin. That fool is not the only man in London who has talked to me of love. Mr. Worthy has been tampering too. Vraiment? Tis true. He has done it in vain. Not all his charms or art or beauty have the power to shake me. But what I wonder is this. I find I did not jolt at Worthy's proposal as I did when it came from one who I condemned. I therefore mention this attempt that I may learn from you whence this difference could proceed, for tis not love, heaven knows. Of course not. You are too devoted a wife. But should I endeavor to diagnose your lack of revulsion at Worthy's advances? I fear my conclusions may alarm you. Bye! <laughs> Bye, Berinthia! Nothing could alarm me but such as would make me out of love with my husband, for loveless sits triumphant in my heart and nothing can dethrone him. But should loveless abdicate again, do you think you should preserve the vacant throne 10 tedious winters more in hopes of his return? Indeed, I think I should. Though I confess, after those obligations he has to my forgiveness, should he abandon me once more, I think my heart would grow extremely urgent to cast him out forever. Were I that thing they call a slighted wife, somebody should run the risk of being that thing they call a husband. Fie! To wrong a husband's bed is a vengeance cause, which, of all vengeance, I it's the sweetest. <laughs> Don't I talk madly? Madly indeed. Yet I'm very innocent. <laughs> that I dare swear you are. I know how to make allowances for your humor. You were always very entertaining company, but I find since marriage and widowhood have shown you the world a little, you are very much improved. There has gone more than that to improve me, if she knew all. For heaven's sake, Olympia, tell me what way I shall take to persuade you to come and live with me. There is one way. Pray, which is that? It is to assure me that I shall be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> if that be all, you shall lie here tonight. Then uh, here I'll stay. 
and with a wild delight. End of Act 2. Act 3, Scene 1, A Room in Lord Foppington's House. Enter Fashion and Foppington. Brother, your servant. Allow me to submit my concern. I heard your lordship was wounded yesterday. How do you find yourself this morning? Uh, so well that I have ordered my coach to the door. I'm very glad of it. Mm, that, I believe, is a lie. Brilly, Tom, tell me one thing. Did not your heart dance a sailor's jig when you heard I was run through the body? Why do you think it should? Because I remember mine did so when I heard our father had breathed his last. Barbarous. Pretty, why so? Because our father treated you very well. Well, now strike me dumb. He starved me. He let me want a, a thousand women for want of, of a thousand pound. Then he saved you from many ill bargains, for I think no woman is worth money that will take money. If I were a younger brother, I should think so too. What, is it possible you can value a woman that can be bought? Really, why not, as well as a stallion? Because a woman has a heart to dispose of, a horse has none. Look you, Tom, of all things that belong to a woman, I have an aversion to her heart. For when once a woman has given you her heart, you can never get rid of the rest of her body. Then you confess you are seldom much in love? Never. Stop my vitals. Then why did you make all this bustle about Amanda Loveless? Because she was a woman of an insolent virtue, and I thought myself piqued in honor to debauch her. Lascivious coxcomb. But now for my business, I know. Brother, though I know to talk of business is a theme not quite so entertaining to you as that the lady is. My necessities are such that I hope you'll have patience to hear me. The greatness of your necessities, Tom, is the worst argument in the world for your being patiently heard. I'm sure you are going to make a very good speech, but strike me dumb. It has the worst beginning of any speech I have ever heard. I'm very sorry you think so. Uh, Mary, so am I. Uh, but come, let's know thy affair quickly, for there's a new play on tonight and the whole town shall be in attendance, and I fear I shall be so rumpled and squeezed with pressing through the crowd to get to my seat that the women will think I have lain all night in my clothes. Well then, that I may not be the author of so great a misfortune, my case in a word is this. The necessary expenses of my travels have so much exceeded the wretched income of my annuity that I have been forced to mortgage it for 500 pounds, which is spent. And therefore, unless you are so kind to assist me in redeeming it, I know no remedy but to turn thief and take a purse. Why, Faith, Tom, uh, to give you my sense of the thing, I do believe taking a purse the best remedy in the world. What? Uh, for if, if you succeed, you have your money, and if you are caught, you shall be put out of your misery by the state. I'm glad to see you are in so pleasant a humor. I hope I shall feel the effects of it. Are you mad? Do you really think it a reasonable thing that I should give you 500 pounds? I do not ask for it as a due, brother. I am willing to receive it as a favor. Ah, pox on it. These are damned hard times to give money in. Taxes are so great, repairs so exorbitant, tenants such rogues, and periwigs so dear that I'm reduced to spending no more than five guineas a month on snuff. Uh, can you imagine? Now, Judge Tom, whether I can spare you 500 pounds. <laughs> If you can't, I must starve, that's all. You should have been wiser with your spending. Zooms, if you can't live upon 5,000 pounds here, how do you think I should do it upon 200? Don't be in passion, Tom, for passion is the most unbecoming thing in the world to the face. Uh, look you, I have no desire to make you melancholy, but upon this occasion, I feel compelled to remind you that a racehorse does require more attendance than a coach horse. Nature has made some difference twixt you and I. Yeah, she has made you older, pox take her. That, that is not all, Tom. Why, what else is there to make us different? Ask the ladies. 
Well, that essence bottle, thou must cat, dost thou truly think thou hast any advantage over me but what fortune has given me? I do. Stop my vitals. Now, by all that's great and powerful, thou art the prince of coxcombs. Sir, I am proud of being the head of so prevailing a party. Will nothing then provoke thee? Draw, coward. Fashion draws his sword on Foppington, who sighs. Look you, Tom. You know I have always taken you for a mighty dull fellow, and here is one of the stupidest plots broke out that I have seen in a long time. Your poverty makes your life so burdensome that you would provoke me to a quarrel in hopes either to slip through my lungs into my estate or to get yourself run through the guts to put an end to your pain. But I will disappoint you in both your designs, for with the temper of a philosopher and the discretion of a statesman, I will go to the play with my sword in my scabbard. Adieu. Exit Foppington. So, farewell, snuffbox. Now, conscience, I defy thee. Laurie! Enter Laurie. Sir. Here's rare news, Laurie. That damned physician, his lordship, has given me a pill which has cured all my scruples. Hallelujah, and my heart's at ease again, for I've been in a lamentable fright, sir, ever since your conscience had the impudence to intrude upon our company. Believe me, it will come no more. My brother has given it a ring by the nose, and I have kicked it down the stairs. So get you to the inn, ready our horses, quickly, and bring them to old Cutler's lodging without a moment's delay. Then, sir, you are going to marry the country cloistress? I am. Stop my vitals. Away, Laurie, fly, fly. <laughs> I am on the wing already. Exeunt severally. Scene two, a garden. Enter Loveless, Solace. Sure, fate has yet some business to be done before Amanda's heart and mine must rest. Else why, amongst those legions of her sex which throng the world, should she pick out for her companion the only one on earth whom nature has endowed for her undoing? Undoing? Was it I said? Who shall undo her? Is not her empire fixed? Am I not hers? Did she not rescue me? A groveling knave, when chained and bound by that cruel tyrant vice, I labored in his vilest drudgery? Did she not ransom me and set me free? Nay, more, when by my follies I was basely sunk to a poor, tattered, despicable beggar, did she not lift me up to envied fortune? Give me herself and all that she possessed. And if she has, am I not strongly bound to love her for it? To love her. Why, do I not love her then? By earth and heaven I do. Nay, I have demonstration that I do. For I would sacrifice my life to serve her. Yet hold, if laying down my life by be but demonstration of my love, what is it I feel in favor of? Berinthia. For should she be in danger, methinks I could incline to risk it for her service too. And yet I do not love her. How then subsists my proof? Good God, defend me from these thoughts. Nay, here she comes. Enter Berinthia. Take heed, my heart, for there are dangers towards. What makes you so thoughtful, sir? I hope that you're not ill. Oh, I was debating, madam, whether I was so or not. Is it then so hard a matter to decide? I thought all people had been acquainting with their own bodies, though few people know their own minds. Uh, what if the distemper be in the mind? Why then, I'll undertake to prescribe you a cure. Alas, you undertake you know not what, for I have reason to believe that should I put myself into your hands, you would increase my distemper. But if your life be already in danger, sir, what risk do you run in trying my skill? Oh, a very great one. How? You might betray my distemper to my wife. Not for the world. Will you then keep my secret? I will. I'm satisfied. Now, hear my symptoms and give me your advice. When twas my chance to see you at the play, 
A random glance you threw first so alarmed me, I could not turn my eyes from whence the danger came. My heart began to pant, my limbs to tremble, my blood grew thin, my pulse beat quick, my eyes grew hot and dim, and all the frame of nature shook with apprehension. And so, to escape your fire, I left the field and fled for shelter to Amanda's arms. What think you of these symptoms, pray? Feverish, every one of them. But what relief, pray, did your wife afford you? Why, instantly she let me blood, which for the present much assuaged my flame. But when I saw you, out it burst again, and raged with greater fury than before. Nay, since you just appeared, tis so increased that if you do not help me, I fear I shall consume to ashes. Lovelace takes hold of Berinthia's hand. Oh, sir, let me go. Tis the plague, and we shall all be infected. Then we'll die together, my charming angel. Lovelace catches Berinthia in his arms and kisses her. Oh, God, the devil's in you and in me. Enter the footman. Lord, let, let me go. Here's someone coming. Sir, my lady's come home and desires to speak with you. She's in her chamber. Tell her I'm coming. Get out. Exit the footman. But before I go, one glass of nectar more to drink her health. Stand off or I shall hate you by heavens. They kiss again. Enter Worthy. What's here? My old mistress and so close to my friend. I would not spoil her sport for the universe. Worthy hides himself. Re-enter the footman. My lord, my lady is coming. For heaven's sake, go! Go! Adieu, my angel. Exeunt the footman and loveless running. Berinthia fans herself as Worthy emerges. <clears throat> Your servant, madam. Where did you come from? Uh, an unconvincing hiding place. Had you had but the wherewithal to look around. I need not ask you how you do, madam. You've got so good a color. No better than I used to have, I suppose. Mm, a little more blood in your cheeks. The weather's hot. It's January. What are you smiling at? You'll never leave your roguery, I see. And you'll never leave your evasions. Well, I can't imagine what you drive at. Pray tell me, what do you mean? <laughs> do you tell me? It's the same thing. I can't. Guess. I shall guess wrong. Indeed you won't. <laughs> Oxcomb, either tell or let it alone. Ah, nay then, I will tell. But first... I must put you in mind that after what has passed twixt you and I, very few things ought to be secrets between us. Why, what secrets do we hide? I know none of them. Yes, there are two. One I have hid from you, and the other you would hide from me. You are fond of Lovelace, which I have discovered, and I am fond of his wife which I have discovered. Very well. I confess your discovery to be true. Now, what do you say to mine? Why, I confess I would swear to her false if I thought you were fool enough to believe me. <laughs> now I am almost in love with you again. And I dare say we can help each other to achieve our goals. Why? Do you think then, Mr. Worthy, I am old enough to be a bod? Uh, I think you are wise enough. I clever enough to distract Amanda with a gallant that she may not see who is her husband's mistress. Well, madam, what do you think on it? I think you are a downright politician. Oh, well, there's high praise from a woman. And so, good Berinthia, let's lose no time. Not till all fiddles are in tune, sir. Your lady's strings will be very apt to fly if they are wound up too hastily. But if you'll have patience to screw them in place by degrees, I think she may endure to be played upon. I and will make admirable music too. Can I but overcome her morals? I have an opinion of your success. 
my dear cousin runs into that common mistake of fond wives who conclude themselves chaste because they can refuse a man they don't like when they have got one they do. <laughs> well, so much for her virtue. Now, one final question, and then everyone to their post. What opinion has she of me? What you could wish. She thinks you handsome and discreet. Excellent. That's thinking half seas over. One tide more brings us into port. Fuck, I hear her coming. Then weigh anchor, Captain Worthy, and be gone as soon as you please. I'm under sail already. Adieu. Bon voyage. Exit Worthy. Enter Amanda with a maid following her. If you please, madam, only to say whether you'll have me to buy him or not. Yes. No. Go, fiddle. I care not what you do. Privy, leave me alone. I have done. Exit the maid. Bless me, cuz. What in the name of Jove is the matter with you? The matter, Berinthia? I'm almost mad. I'm plagued to death. Who is it that plagues you? Who do you think should plague a wife but her husband? Oh, does it come to that? We shall have you wish yourself a widow by and by. Would I were anything but what I am, a base, ungrateful man after what I have done for him to use me thus? Has he been ogling again? I ogling and admiring and I know not what. And so you are jealous. Is that all? That all? Is jealousy nothing then? <laughs> it should be nothing if I were in your case. Why? What would you do? I'd cure myself. How? Set the leeches to my fonder blood. Care as little for my husband as he did for me. That would not stop his course. Nothing will stop his course to infidelity, cousin, if he has his mind set to it. But I tell you, madam, no man worth having is true to his wife. Do you really think he's false to me? For I did but suspect him. Think him false? I know him false. Is it possible? Pray, tell me what you know. Alas, don't press me to name names, for that I have sworn I won't do. Then let me know all you can without perjury. Then, to my certain knowledge, your husband is a pickering elsewhere. You are sure on it? Positively. He fell in love at the play. Right, the very same. Do you know the ugly thing? Yes, I know her well enough, but she's no ugly thing either. Is she very handsome? Truly, I think so. Oh, bastard! I think, yes, your husband is most certainly that. I'm very ill. I must go to my chamber. Dear Berinthia, don't leave me in a moment. Never fear me, sweet cuz. I'll attend you. Exeunt the women, Amanda leaning upon Berinthia. Scene three, a country house. Enter Fashion and Lori. So here's our inheritance, Lori, if we can get into possession. But methinks this country abode looks like Noah's Ark, as if the chief part of it were designed for the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Pray, sir, don't let your head run upon the particulars of architecture. Get but the heiress. Let the devil take the house. <sighs> Get but the house. Let the devil take the heiress. Especially if she be as ugly as Coupler described her. But come, we've no time to squander. Knock at the door. Laurie knocks at the door. There is no answer. What the devil? Have they got no ears in this house? Knock harder. Lori knocks again. There is no answer. Egad, sir, this will prove some enchanted castle. We shall have the giant appear by and by with his club and beat our brains out. Hush, I hear footsteps. A voice Who's there? issues from within. Who's there? Open the door and see. Is this your country breeding? Aye, but two words to a bargain. William, is the blunderbuss primed? Loons, give him good words, Lori. We should be shot. Uh, the lot ho, master, master, what, what do you call him? Enter a porter at the window holding a loaded rifle. Well now, 
What's your business? Nothing, sir, but to wait upon Sir Tunbelly with your leave. To wait upon Sir Tunbelly. Why, you'll find that's just as Sir Tunbelly pleases. But will you do me the favor, sir, to know whether Sir Tunbelly pleases or not? Why, look, you, with a few good words, much may be done. <clears throat> Ralph, go thy ways and ask Sir Tunbelly if he pleases to be waited upon. And you hear, call the nurse so she may lock up Miss Hoyden before the gates open. Do you hear that, Laurie? Aye, sir, I'm afraid we shall have a hard time on it. First a porter with a shotgun and now a nurse for a prison guard? We shall be dead within the hour. Not if I can help it. But see the door opens. Enter Sir Tunbelly, leading a bevy of servants who are armed with guns, clubs, pitchforks, sides, etc. Lori hides behind fashion. Oh, God of mercy, this is how it ends. Take heed, fool. Thy fear will ruin us. Mary, sir, thy courage will murder us. Who is it here has any business with me? Sir, tis I, if your name be Sir Tunbelly Clumsy. Sir, my name is Sir Tunbelly Clumsay. Whether you have any business with me or not. So you see, I'm not ashamed of my name, nor my face neither. Sir, you have no cause that I know of. Sir, you have no cause neither. I desire to know who you are, for till I know your name, I shall not ask you to come into my house. And when I know your name, tis ten to one I won't like you enough to invite you anyway. Sir... I hope you'll find this letter to be authentic passport. Sir Tunbelly reads the paper fashion has given him. <gasps> God's my life. <laughs> I, uh, I ask your lordship pardon 10,000 times. Uh, Ralph, uh, run indoors quickly. Get a scotch coal fire in the great parlor. Set all the chairs in their places. Get the great brass candlesticks out and be sure to stick the sockets full of laurel. Run! Exit to servant. Uh, my dear, kind, amiable, handsome Lord Poppington, I ask your lordship's pardon a thousand times. Go, William, do you hear? Run to the nurse and bid her let Miss Hoyden loose again and instruct her to put on a clean petticoat quick. Exit uh, another servant. Uh, I hope your honour will excuse the disorder of my family. We're not used to receive men of your lordship's great quality every day. <laughs> Uh, pray, where are your coaches and servants, my lord? Sir, that I might give you and your fair daughter a proof how impatient I am to be nearer akin to you. I left my equipage at home to follow me and galloped here with only one servant. Oh, your, your, your lordship does me too much honour. It was exposing your person to too much fatigue and danger. I protest it was, but... Uh, my daughter shall endeavour to make you what amends she can, and though I, I should not say it, Hoyden has charms. <laughs> Sir, I am not a stranger to them, though I am to her. Common fame has done your daughter justice. Uh, my lord, I am common fame's very humble servant. My, my girl's but young, quite young, my lord, but this I must say for her, what she... Once in art, she has by nature what she wants in experience, she has in breeding, and what's wanting in her age is made good in her beauty. So, I <laughs> pray, my lord, uh, walk in. Uh, walk in, my, my, my lord. Sir, I wait upon you. Exeunt all. Enter Miss Hoyden, Solace. Sure, never nobody was used as I am. I know well enough what other girls do, for they all think to make a fool of me. It's well I have a husband coming, or egad, I'll marry the baker, so I would. Nobody can so much as knock at the gate, but presently I must be locked up. And here's a young greyhound puppy can run loose about the house all day long, so she can box on it, what I were a dog. Miss Hoyden, Miss, 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 Miss Hoyden. Enter the nurse. Well, nurse, what do you make a noise for, huh? What did my poor eardrums ever do to you? Here's one come at the door, madam, who will make them red as the morning sun. No, what care I for who's come? I care not a fig for who's come. 
nor who goes, as long as it means I shall be locked up in the cellar like a wine of three score vintage. That precaution, miss, is for fear you should be drunk before you are ripe. Oh, don't you fear your head about that. I'm as ripe as you, though never so mellow. Well, now I have a good mind to lock you up again and not let you see my lord tonight. My lord? Did you say my lord? Mary, did I? Why, nurse, is my husband come at last? Mary, is he? I think he is. It would be a fine thing. Well, is he or no? Tell me quick or I shall burst. Yes, he is come and a goodly person too. Hoyden shrieks with delight and hugs the nurse. <gasps> Dear, dear nurse, tell me everything. I long to be excruciatingly in love with him. What color is his hair? Well, faith, I know not. Oh, I know thou dost. Perhaps I do. What color then? I think I had better leave that and his lordship's other features to your discovery. I'll say only this. I believe the young man's visage shall be acceptable to you. I'll go and put on my best smock then and pull the laces so tight my waist disappears and the blood runs down my back. Away! Exit Miss Hoyden running. Now the Lord in heaven succor thee. How thou art delighted. Exit the nurse after Hoyden. Re-enter Sir Tunbelly, fashion, and a servant with wine. <coughs> my, my lord, I'm proud of the honour to see your lordship within my doors, and I humbly crave leave to bid you welcome with uh, a, a cup of wine. <laughs> so, to your daughter's health. They drink. Alas, poor Hoyden, she'll be fretted out of her wits on her wedding night for... <laughs> honestly speaking, she does not know a man from a woman, but by his beard and his breeches. <laughs> and you do not even have a beard. Sir, I don't doubt your daughter has a virtuous education, which, with the rest of her merit, makes me long to make her mine. I wish you would dispense with the canonical hour and let it be this very night. Oh, uh, not, not so soon, neither. That, <laughs> that shooting my girl before you bid her stand. No, give her fair warning. We'll, we'll, we'll sign and seal tonight, if you please. And on this day seven night, we'll let the jade look to her quarters. This day seven night, what are you taking for a ghost? Slife, sir, I am made of flesh and blood and bones and sinew and can no more live a week without your daughter than I can live a month with her. Uh, uh, you are too hasty, sir. I am too in love, sir. Pray, sir, let the marriage be done without ceremony. It will save money. Money? What? Save money when my hoyden's to be married? Gags, I'll give my girl a wedding dinner, shall bankrupt the kingdom, so I will, for the girl is my daughter. And I have a craving for fresh turkey. Therefore, my noble lord, have a little patience. We'll go and look over our deeds and settlements immediately. And as for your bride, though you may lament the day of consummation, I'll engage for my girl. She's a feast worth waiting for. <laughs> End of Act 3. Act 4, Scene 1. Enter Miss Hoyden and the nurse. Well, Miss, how do you like your husband that is to be? Oh, Lord, nurse, I'm so overjoyed. I can scarce contain myself. Ah, uh, but you must have a care of being too fond, for men nowadays hate a woman that loves them. <laughs> love him? Why do you think I love him, nurse? I would not care if Lord Foppington were hanged, so long as he first gets me up to London and liberty. Look, look, his honor be a-coming towards you. Now, if I were sure you would behave yourself handsomely and discreetly, I'd leave you alone together. Oh, that's my best nurse, dear sweet nurse, how I love thee. Now go away. Exit the nurse, enter fashion. Your servant, madam, I'm glad to find you alone, for I have something of importance to speak to you about. Sir, my lord, I mean, you may speak to me about whatever you please, and I shall give you a civil answer. I take you at your word. 
Your father, as you know, has resolved to make me your husband, and I hope I may depend on your consent to perform what he desires. Sure, I never disobey my father in anything but the eating of green gooseberries, because they are disgusting. Uh, so good a daughter must needs be an, be an admirable wife. I am therefore impatient till you are mine. Ooh, not as impatient as I am. Then I hope you will so far consider the violence of my love that you won't have the cruelty to defer my happiness so long as your father designs it. Pray, my lord, how long is that? Madam, a thousand years. A whole week. A week? Why, I shall be an old woman by that time. And I an old man, which you'll find a greater misfortune than the other. Why, I thought it was to be tomorrow morning, as soon as I was up. I'm sure nurse told me so. And it shall be tomorrow morning still, if you'll consent. If I consent? <laughs> Why, I thought I was to obey you as my husband. That's after we are married. So then I am to obey you. <laughs> well, if we are to take turns, then methinks there's no harm in exchanging duties as thus. I will obey you before we are married, and you shall obey me afterwards. With all my heart. But I think we must get the nurse on our side, or we shall hardly prevail with the chaplain. Oh, yes, she shall be essential, for the chaplain loves nurse more than he loves his pulpit, and has often preached to her privately behind closed doors. Why then, my dear fellow, if you'll call her hither, we'll try to persuade her. It will be the easiest thing in the world. Simply tell her she's a wholesome, beautiful woman, and give her half a crown. Nay, if that's all it takes, she'll have a half score of them. Oh, Gemini, for half of that, she'll marry her, you herself. I'll run and call her. Exit Miss Hoyden. So matters go swimmingly. This is a rare girl in faith. I shall have a fine time of it with her in London. I'm much mistaken if she doesn't prove a March hair all the year round. What a scampering chase she'll make on it. I shall find the whole kennel of Beau at her jail. I to the park and the play and the church and the devil shall show him sport, I warrant her. But I think I like her better for it. Re-enter Miss Hoyden and the nurse. How do you do, good mistress nurse? I desired your young lady would give me leave to see you, that I might thank you for your extraordinary care and conduct in her education. Pray accept this small acknowledgement for it at present, and depend upon my further kindness while I shall be that happy thing, her husband. Fashion gives the nurse a half a crown. Gold by Herod! Your honor's goodness is too great. All I can boast of is I gave her poor good milk I did, and had you only seen how the poor thing sucked it, how it used to hang at this poor teat and suck and squeeze and kick and sprawl till the belly on it was so full and then twould drop off like a leech. Oh, that's quite enough, nurse. Don't stand ripping up old stories to make one ashamed before one's love. Do you think Lord Boppington cares a fiddle for your saggy teats? We have business to discuss. Business, madam? Aye, the most serious business in the world, that of true love. His honor, my lord, desires you'll be so kind as to let us be married tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, dear madam? Yes, tomorrow, sweet nurse, privately. Young folks, you know, are impatient, and my father, Sir Tunbelly, would have us wait a whole week for the wedding dinner. Now, all things being signed and sealed and agreed, I fancy there could be no great harm in practicing a scene or two of matrimony in private if only to give us the better assurance when we come to play it in public. Nay, I must confess stolen pleasures are sweet. But you should be married now. What, what will you do when Sir Tunbelly calls for you to be wedded? Why, then we'll be married again. What, twice? Egad, I don't care how often I'm married, not I. Nor I, indeed. Pray, nurse, don't you be against your young lady's good, for by this means she'll have the pleasure of two wedding days. And of two wedding nights, nurse. 
Well, I'm such a tender hearted fool. I find I can refuse you nothing. So you shall even follow your own intentions. Shall I? Oh, Lord, I could leap over the moon. Dear nurse, this goodness of yours shan't go unrewarded. But now you must employ your power with Mr. Bull, the chaplain, that he may do his friendly office for us, and then we shall be all happy. Do you think you can prevail with him? Oh, I can prevail with him, or he shall never prevail with me. I can tell him that. I'll do your honor's business in the catching of a garter. Exit the nurse. Come, madam, dare you venture yourself alone with me? <laughs> Dear, yes, sir, I don't think you'll do anything to me I need be afraid on. He kisses her hand. Exeunt Fashion and Hoyden. Enter Amanda and Berinthia. Well, now, Berinthia, I am at leisure to hear what twas... Well, now, Berinthia, I am at leisure to hear what twas you had to say to me. What I had to say was only to echo the sighs and groans of a dying lover. Fie, cousin. Will you never learn to talk of anything in earnest? By my faith, sweet, cause I am in earnest. And truly, I must confess to you what I have suffered upon your account. On my account? Yes, yours. I have been forced to sit still and hear you commended for two hours together without one single compliment to myself. Now, how on earth should a woman of my youth and beauty endure such an ordeal? Alas, I should have been unconcerned at it, for I never knew where the pleasure lay of being praised by men. But pray, who was this that commended me so? One you have a mortal aversion to. I prithee who? Mr. Worthy. He used you like a text. He took you all to pieces, but spoke so learnedly upon every point one might see the spirit of the church was in him. If you are a woman, you'd have been in an ecstasy to have heard how feelingly he handled your hair, your eyes, your mouth, your tongue, your neck, and so forth. Ah! Alas, Berinthia, did I incline to a gallant, which you know I do not. Do you think a man so handsome as worthy could have the least concern for such a plain, unpolished, unpolished thing as I am? It is impossible. Now you have a great mind to put me upon commending you. <laughs> Indeed, that was not my design. Nay, if it were, it is all one, for I won't do it. I leave you to your looking glass. But to show you that I have some good nature left, I'll commend him. And perhaps that may do as well. If you have a great mind to persuade me, I am in love with him. I have a great mind to persuade you you don't know what you are in love with. I'm sure I'm not in love with him, nor never shall be, so let that pass. But you were saying something you would commend him for? Indeed, I was. And I'll give you this account of him. That though it is possible he may have had women with as good faces as your ladyship, yet you must know your cautious behavior with that reserve in your humor has given him his death's wound. He mortally hates a coquette. He says tis impossible to love where he cannot esteem and that no woman can be esteemed by a man of sense if she makes herself cheap in the eyes of a fool. This is his doctrine, how do you like it? So well that since I never intend to have a gallant for myself, if I were to recommend a lover to a friend, Mr. Worthy should be the man. Enter Worthy. Bless me, he's here. Pray heaven he did not hear me. If he did, it won't hurt your reputation. Your thoughts are as safe in his heart as in your own. I venture in at an unseasonable time of night, ladies. I hope if I am troublesome, you'll use the same freedom in turning me out again. Uh, I believe it can't be too late for Mr. Loveless has not come home yet and he usually keeps good hours. Madam, I'm afraid he'll transgress a little tonight, for he told me about half an hour ago that he was going to sup with some company he suspects will keep him out till three or four o'clock in the morning. And he desired I would let my servant acquaint you with it, that you might not expect him. Indeed. But alas, my valet is a dunderhead, so lest he should make some mistake, I thought it my duty to deliver the message myself. 
I am very sorry. My husband should give you that trouble, sir. Uh, but but since he has, will you give me leave, madam, to keep Mr. Worthy to play an ombre with us? Cousin, you know you command my house. <laughs> And madam, you know you command me, though I am a very wretched gamester. Oh, you weigh pl play well enough to lose your money. <laughs> all the ladies require. So, without any more ceremony, let us go into the next room and call for the car. With all my heart. Worthy offers Amanda his arm. They exit. Well, <clears throat> how this business will end, heaven knows. But she seems to be in as fair a way as a boy is to be a rogue when he's put clerk to an attorney. Nothing to do now but wait for fruition. Exit Berinthia. Scene two, Berinthia's chamber. Enter Loveless cautiously in the dark. So, thus far, all's well. I am got into her bedchamber, and I think nobody has perceived me steal into the house. My wife does not expect me home till four o'clock. So if Berinthia comes to bed by 11, I shall have a chance of five hours. Let me see, where shall I hide myself? Under her bed? No, I shall have her maid searching there for something or other. Her closet's a better place. And I have a master key will open it. I'll leave it in there and attack her just when she comes to her prayers. Aye, that's the critical minute for the devil will be there to assist me. Loveless opens the closet, goes in, and shuts the door after him. Enter Berinthia with a candle in hand. Well, sure I am the best-natured woman in the world. I, that love cards so well, there is but one thing I love better. I have pretended to have letters to write, to give my friends a tete-a-tete. -tete. However, I'm thoroughly innocent, for Paquette is the game I set him to at her own peril, be it, if she ventures to play with him at any other. But now what shall I do with myself? Read a book? Tis dull, but sufficient. Brinthia picks up a book, opens the door to her closet, sees Loveless, and shrieks. Ah! A ghost! A oh lord, a ghost! A ghost! Peace, peace, my dear. It's no ghost. Take it in your arms, you'll find tis worth a hundred of them. You must be mad to hazard such a trick as this. I am very well pleased with my trick thus far, and shall be so till I have played it out. Where's my wife? At cards. With whom? With Worthy. Mm, then we are safe. Some husbands would be of another mind if he were at cards with their wives. And they'd be in the right on it, too. But I dare trust Amanda. She has more virtue than desire. What said she to my staying abroad so late? The news put her decidedly out of humor. Excellent. Then she suspects nothing. And therefore, my dear charming angel, let us now make good use of our time. Heavens, what do you mean? What do you think I mean? I don't know. I'll show you. You may as well tell me. No, that would make you blush worse than the other. Why do you intend to make me blush? <laughs> Faith, I can't tell that. But if I do, it shall be in the dark. Loveless pulls Berinthia towards the closet. Oh, heavens. I would not be in the dark with you for all the world. Let us test your resolve. Loveless blows out the candles. <laughs> Lord, are you mad? What shall I do for light? You'll do as well without it. Nay, never pull me, for I will not go. Then you must be carried. Loveless carries Berinthia into the closet. <laughs> Help! Help! I'm ravished! Ruined! Undone! Oh, Lord, I shall never be able to bear it. Exeunt. Scene three, Sir Tunbully's house. Enter Miss Hoyden, nurse, fashion, and the chaplain, Bull. This quick dispatch of yours, Mr. Bull, I take so kindly that I shall give you a claim to my favor as long as I live. And mine too, I promise you. I most humbly thank your honors. And I hope since it has been my lot to join you in the holy bands of wedlock, you will so well cultivate the soil which I've craved a blessing on, that your children may swarm about you like bees on a honeycomb. The more the merrier, sir. Enter Lori, taking his master hastily aside. 
One word with you, sir, for heaven's sake. What the devil's the matter? Sir, your fortune's ruined and we are dead men. Yonder, your brother has arrived with two coaches and six horses, 20 footmen and pages, a coat worth 80 pound and a pair of wig down to his knees. He has come to claim his bride. Death and furies, tis impossible. Fiends and specters, tis true. Is he in the house yet? No, they are capitulating with him at the gate. The porter thinks him a highwayman and has cocked the rifle at him. But your brother shouts that he must have a word with Sir Tunbelly, so I'm sure all will come out presently. Hush, let me think. My dear wife, here's a troublesome business, my man tells me of. There's an impudent fellow at the gate who, not knowing I had come, has taken my name upon him in hopes to run away with you. Oh, the brazen Faced varlet, it's well we were married so speedily then to thwart him. Prithee, doctor, run to Sir Tunbelly and stop him from going to the gate before I speak with him. I fly, my good lord. Exit bull. And it please your honor, my lady and I had best lock ourselves up till the danger be over. Aye, aye, by all means. Not so fast. I won't be locked up anymore. I'm married. Yes, but pray do, my dear, till we have seized this rascal. Nay, husband, if you pray me, I'll do anything. Exeunt Miss Hoyden and the nurse. Here's Sir Tunbelly coming. Hark you, Laurie, things are better than you imagine. The wedding's over. The devil it is, sir. She's still a virgin, is she not? She is my wife in the eyes of God. And in the eyes of your brother, sir, what will she be to him? Hush. Re-enter Bull with Sir Tunbelly and his bevy of armed servants. Sir Tunbelly, did you ever hear, sir, of so impudent an undertaking? Never by the mass, but we'll tickle him, I warrant you. They tell me, sir, that Charlotte has a great many people with him disguised like servants. I waymen, your honor, every one of them rogues. Sir, if you'll take my advice, I have a plot will neutralize him. Whoever this spark is, he knows nothing of my being privately here. So if you pretend to receive him civilly, he'll enter without suspicion. And then, as soon as he is within the gates, we'll whip up the drawbridge upon his back, let fly the blunderbuss to disperse the crew, and so commit him to jail. Egad, <laughs> your lordship is an ingenious person and a very great general, but uh, should we kill any of them or not? No, no, only fire over their heads to frighten them. I, I warrant the regiment flees when the colonel's a prisoner. Uh, then come along, my boys, and let your courage be great, <laughs> for your danger is but small. Exeunt. Scene four, the gate before Sir Tunbelly's house. Enter Foppington with his equipage. Oh, a pox of these bumpkinly people. Will they open the gate, or do they desire I should swim across their moat like a dolphin? Uh, you there, porter, uh, prithee, do me the favor in as few words as possible. Do tell me whether thy master will admit me or not, that I may turn about my coach and be gone. Here's my master himself now at hand. He'll give you his answer. Uh, Enter Sir Tunbelly and his noble. army of servants. My most noble lord, I crave your pardon for making your honor wait so long, but my orders to my servants have been to admit nobody without my knowledge for fear of some attempts upon my daughter's virtue. Uh, must, much caution, I must confess, is a sign of great wisdom, but stop my vitals. I have grown cold enough with waiting in the snow to kill your porter here. I am very sorry for it indeed, my lord, but if your uh, lordship please to walk in, we'll help you to a, a roasting half. Sir, I follow you with pleasure. Exeon Foppington and Sir Tunbelly. As Foppington's servants go to follow them in, Tunbelly's servants close the door to them. Nay, hold you there, sir. Why, what the devil mean you to keep us out, sir? You see our master goes within arm in arm with yours. Your master has got leave to enter the house. Sir, you have not. This is absurd, sir. This is England, sir. We're defending our ramparts, sir. Against what? I'm a valet, not a soldier. That will make this next part very easy then. What part? Have at you, gentlemen. Ready, aim, fire! 
The porter and his fellow servant fire their rifles above the heads of Foppington's equipage. They scatter and run away, screaming. Frenzy! Magnus, help! Help! We're under attack! Not one soldier left by the mass. A job very well done. <clears throat> Exeunt. Scene five, a hall in Sir Tunbelly's house. Enter Sir Tunbelly, Chaplain Bull, a constable and servants leading Foppington. Come, bring him along. Bring what? him along. What the pox do you mean, gentlemen, that you are all drunk before dinner? Drunk, sirrah? Here's an impudent rogue for you. Drunk or sober, bully, I'm a justice of the peace and know how to deal with strollers. Strollers? Aye, strollers. Come, give an account of yourself. What's your name? Where do you live? Are you a Willemite or a Jacobite? Come. Then why dost thou ask me so many impertinent questions? Because I'll make you answer them before I've done with you, you rascal, you. The only answer I can make is thou art a very strange old fellow. Stop my vitals. Nay, sir, I confess your designs all be damned. I know, I know thou hast come to rob me of my daughter, villain. Rob thee of thy daughter. Now I do begin to believe I am abed and asleep, and this is all but a dream. A pretty strange man. Uh, oh. Didst thou not write to my Lord Foppington to come down and marry thy daughter? Yes, Mary, did I? And my Lord Foppington is come down and shall marry my daughter before she's a day older. Ah, why then give me thy hand, father. I am glad we understand one another at last. This fellow's mad. Here, bind him hand and foot. Sir Tunbelly's servants bind Foppington in ropes. Nay, a pretty night, night, leave fooling. Thy jest begins to grow dull. Find him, I say, he's mad. Bread and water, a dark room, and a whip may bring him to his senses again. Enter Miss Hoyden and Nurse. Is this the fellow that would have run away with me? Oh, how he stinks of perfume. A pray, father, let him be dragged naked through the horse pond. Ah, this must be my wife for her natural inclination to her husband. Pray, father, what do you intend to do with him? Hang him? Or at the very least, child. Hanging's good for a man, builds character. Ah, the nursemaid, I presume, by her ferocity. Uh, what's become of my lord, daughter? He's just coming, sir. My lord? What does he mean by that, I wonder? Enter Fashion and Lorry. When Foppington sees Fashion, he starts. <clears throat> now, stop my vitals. Uh, Tom! I begin to perceive I am not dreaming at all. Is this the fellow, sir, that designed to trick me out of your daughter? This is he, my lord. How do you like him? Does he not play the lord well? I find by his dress that he thought your daughter might be seduced by a bow. Oh, Gemini, is this a bow? Let me see him again. Miss Hoyden examines Lord Foppington. Huh. I find a bow is no such ugly thing, neither. You get, she'll be in love with him presently. I'll have him jailed in Italy. I'll have him jailed in Italy. <laughs> oh, oh, I am sorry. <clears throat> Sir, though your undertaking shows you are a person of no great modesty, I, I suppose you haven't the confidence to expect much favor from me. Strike me dumb, Tom. Thou art a very impudent fellow. Or has to Bartlett the effrontery to call his lordship plain Thomas? I see the business, madam. He would feign himself mad to avoid going to jail. This must be the chaplain by his unfolding of mysteries. That sham will not pass with us. We've already drawn up the warrant for your arrest. So, now, constable, away with him. I'll hold you! One moment, pray, gentlemen. My... Lord Foppington, shall I beg one word with your lordship? Oh, 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 it's my lord with him now. See how bad fortune will humble folks? Foppington leads fashion into a corner. Look you, Tom, I am sensible that I have not been so kind to you as I ought, but I hope you'll forget what's past and accept of the 5,000 pounds I offer. Thou mayst live in extreme splendor with it. Stop my vitals. 
It's a much easier matter to prevent a disease than to cure it, brother. A quarter of that sum would have secured your mistress. Twice as much won't redeem her. Fashion returns to the company. Well, what says he? Oh, the rascal offered me a bribe to let him go. Treacherous schemer! Uh, uh, pox take him! Lead on, constable! Uh, one word more, and I've done. Uh, there is a gentleman of this country whom I believe cannot live far from this place, and if he were here, he would satisfy that I am novelty, Baron of Foppington, with 5,000 pounds a year, and that fellow there is a rascal not worth a groat. The gentleman's name? Sir John Friendly. Indeed. Well, Sir John is an old acquaintance of mine. I'll send for him immediately. Here, Constable, away with speed, and desire my good neighbour, Sir John Friendly, to step over upon an extraordinary occasion. And in the meanwhile, you'd best secure this sharper in the gatehouse. Nay, but is it a clean gatehouse, sir? For stop my vitals. I would not muddy my clothes for all the world. Nay, tis as filthy as your soul. Away with him! Exeunt the constable and Foppington, as Miss Hoyden and the nurse withdraw. God, I must prevent this night's coming, or this house will grow soon too hot to hold me. So, I fancy tis not worthwhile to trouble Sir John Friendly upon this impertinent fellow's desire. I'll call the messenger back. No, with all my heart. <laughs> I dare say this recreant will say anything to save his skin. Enter the porter. Sir. I met Sir John just lighting at the gate. He said he has come to wait upon you. Oh, nay, then it happens as one could wish. Devil it does. Laurie, you see how things are. You will be a discovery presently, Then we shall have our brains beat out. For my brother will never acknowledge me as his relation. Therefore, run into the stable. Take the two ho first horses you can light on, and I'll flip out the back door and will away immediately. What, leave your wife, sir? I'll come back for her when... Is safe, I hope. Get thee away, I'll still after thee. Exeunt Laurie, <sighs> followed by fashion. Enter Sir John Friendly at the other door. Oh, Sir John, <laughs> you are the welcomest man alive. I just sent a message to a messenger to desire you'd step over. We're all in arms here. Oh, how so? Well, you must know a cynical sort of tawdry fellow here. Hearing that the match was concluded between my Lord Foppington and my girl Hoyden, comes impudent, comes impudently to the gate, and with a whole pack of rogues in liveries, would have passed upon me for his lordship. Oh. But what does I? I comes up to him boldly at the head of his guards, takes him by the throat, strikes up his heels, binds him hands and foot, serves him a warrant, and commits him prisoner to the gatehouse. Ha! Hey, ha! But how do you know this was not? my Lord Foppington, for I was told he set out from London the day before me with a very fine retinue, and I in and he intended to come directly hither. No, 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 no. Sir John, the real man, came two nights ago with only one servant is and is now in the house with me. <laughs> but you don't know the cream of the jest yet. Uh, tell me. The, the, this same imposter, probably assuming we were out of the country, quoted you for his acquaintance. <laughs> and he said, if you were here, you'd justify him to be Lord Foppington. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, pray, will you let me see him? Aye, aye, that you shall presently. Uh, doctor, fetch his lordship here. Exit bull. I, um, I hope, Sir Tunbelly, that the young lady is not married yet. No, things won't be ready this week, but uh, why do you hope she's not married? A, a foolish fancy, sir. I'm, perhaps I'm mistaken. Re-enter Bull. Sir, Lord Foppington is just ridden out to take the air. He took his valet with him. Take the air? Is that his London breeding to go to take the air when gentlemen come to visit him? Nay, I begin to suspect. Re-enter the constable, leading Foppington, bound in chains. Stop my vitals. I'll have satisfaction. My dear Lord Foppington. Dear friendly. Oh. Dear friendly. Thou art come in a critical minute, dear friend. Strike me dumb. 
Why, I little thought to have found you in fetters. I promise you, Sir John, thou canst not be half so astonished as I am. Is it then possible that this should be the true Lord Foppington at last? Why, what do you see in his face to make you doubt of it? If you had seen as many lords as I have done, Sir Tunbelly, you would not doubt my quality, I am sure. Unbind him, rascal! The constable unbinds Foppington. My lord, I'm struck dumb. I, I, I can only beg pardon by signs, but, but if a sacrifice will appease you, you shall have it. Here, here, here constable, pursue this tartar. This, this tr true impostor, bring him back. Away, I say. By our lady, I'll cut off his ears and his tail. I'll draw out his teeth. I'll pull his skin over his head and... Oh, no, not what? No, he does indeed deserve to be made an example of. He does indeed stop my vitals. <laughs> May I then hope I have your honor's pardon? Uh, sir, we courtiers do nothing without a bribe, but that fair young lady might do miracles. Uh, boy, da. Come hither, boy, da. Miss Horton advances. Hoyden is her name, sir? Uh, yes, my lord. A good name to make poetry on. My lord, she's yours. She has a wholesome body and virtuous mind. She's a, a woman, uh, complete both in flesh and spirit. Yes, it is. Now, stand aside, Hoyden. Miss Hoyden withdraws. Sir? I receive your daughter like a gentleman. Oh, then I'm a happy man and the Lord bless your honor. Here come my noble peer, I, I believe dinner's ready. If your honor pleases to follow me, I'll lead you on the attack of a venison pasty. Exit Sir Tunbelly. Uh, Sir John, I wait upon you. Will your ladyship do me the favor of your little finger, madam? Um, my lord, I'll follow you presently. I have a little business with my nurse. Your ladyship's most humble servant. Exeunt Foppington and Sir John. So, nurse, we are finally brought to bed. What shall we do now? Ah, dear miss, we are all undone. Mr. Bull, do advise us. Alack a day, madam. It's past my skill now. I can do nothing. But I can. And so, if you two fools be sure to hold your tongues and not say a word of what's past, I'll even marry this lord too. What? Two husbands, my dear? Well, you had three husbands, good nurse. You may hold your tongue. Aye, but all together, sweet child. Tis a sin, sweetie. Nay, that's my business to speak to, nurse. I do confess to take two husbands for the satisfaction of the flesh is to commit the sin of exorbitancy, but to do it for the peace of the spirit is no more than to be drunk by way of, of physic. And therefore I do think, though Miss should marry again, she may be saved. Egad, and I will marry again then. And so there is an end of the story. End of act four. Act five, scene one, a room in Coupler's lodging in London. Enter Coupler, Fashion, and Laurie. And so, Sir John coming in. And so, Sir John coming in. I thought it best for me to get out, which I did. And you know, of course, I was fast like right away. The devil had been at the rear of me. Uh, so did I. What has happened since, heaven knows. <laughs> oh, he got Sarah. I know as well as heaven. What do you know? That you are a cuckold. The devil I am, by who? By your brother. My brother? Which way? The old way. He has lain with your wife. <sighs> I'm furious. It cannot be. Oh, faith, but it is. You left your wife a widow, and she married again. It's a lie. It's not. But is it possible a young strumpet could play me such a trick? <laughs> a young strumpet, sir, can play 20 tricks. How camest thou by this intelligence? from your brother in this this letter. Now there, you may read it. Coupler gives Fashion a paper, which he reads. 
He says Hoyden is in love with him. Well, perhaps she is. Perhaps the sky is orange. Mm. You must pay my master no mind, Mr. Coupler. He has a particular he has a peculiar affinity for the creature. He's my wife. Not anymore. Coupler, what's to be done? Well, nothing's to be done till the bride and bridegroom come to town. Bride and bridegroom. I can't bear that thou shouldst call him so. I, what shall I call them? Dog and cat? No, that sounds more like man and wife than the other. Well, if you hear, if you'll hear of them in no language, we'll leave them for the nurse and the chaplain. The devil and the witch. When they come to town, whereupon we must invite him to supper, give him fat capons, sack and sugar, a purse of gold, <laughs> some rascal's plump sister, and plot our retribution. Thou art a profound statesman. I'll allow it. But how shall we gain the nurse? Oh, never fear the nurse. She'll do whatever the chaplain commands. Now, there's nothing more to be said of the matter at this time. So let's us go and inquire if they have come to town yet. But let me tell you one thing, by the way, Fashion, that may serve you well in the future. If thou hadst behaved thyself as thou shouldst have done and braved the storm, the girl would never have left thee. Exeunt. Scene two, Berinthia's apartment. Enter Worthy and Berinthia, meeting. Well, sir, what news brings you? No news, madam. There's only a woman going to cuckold her husband. Amanda? I hope so. Speed her well. Stay, madam. The lady still has one scruple which you must remove. What's that? Her virtue, she says. And do you believe her? No, but I believe it's what she takes for her virtue. That is, some relic of lawful love. She is not yet fully satisfied her husband has got another mistress. And unless I can convince her of it, I have opened the trenches in vain. For the breach must be wider before I dare storm the town. So I'm to be your engineer. I'm sure you know best how to manage the battery. What think you of springing a mine? I have thought just now come into my head of, of how to blow her up at once. Tell me of it. We are all invited to my Lord Foppington's tonight for supper, for he's newly come to town with his bride, and make it the ball with an entertainment of music. Now, my beloved undoer, Loveless, <laughs> says he must needs meet me about some private business before we go to the company. To which end he has told his wife one lie and I have told her another. But to make her amends, I'll go immediately and tell her a solemn truth. What's that? Why, I'll tell her that to my certain knowledge, her husband has a rendezvous with his mistress this afternoon, and that if she'll give me their word, she will keep hidden. I'll direct her to a place where she shall meet them. Now, my dear worthy, this is, this I fancy may help you to a critical minute. For home she must go again to dress for the ball. You, with your good breeding, come to wait upon us there, find Amanda all alone, her spirit inflamed against her husband for his treason, her blood on fire, her conscience in ice, a lover to draw and the devil to drive, et voila, she is thine. Thou angel of light, let me fall down and adore thee. Thou minister of darkness, get up again, for I hate to see the devil at his devotions. <laughs> Here she comes. Get away, thou villain, get away. Farewell, thou best of women. Exit worthy. Enter Amanda. <sighs> mm, who was that went from you? A friend of yours. What does he want? Something you might spare him and be never the poorer. I can spare him nothing but my friendship. My love is already disposed of, though I confess to one ungrateful to my bounty. And there's the rub. You have been so bountiful, you have cloyed him. Fond wives do by their husbands as barren wives do by their lapdogs. Cram them with sweetmeats till they spoil their stomachs. 
Oh, alas, cousin, had you but seen how passionately fond Lovelace has been since our last reconciliation, you would have thought it were impossible he ever should have breathed an hour without me. Oh, dear cuz, you must understand that in matters of love, men's eyes are always bigger than their bellies. No sooner are they hungry than they dine and forget. Well, there's nothing upon earth astonish me, astonishes me more than the inconstancy of men. Now, there is nothing upon earth astonishes me less. But do you think all men are of this temper? All but one. Who's that? Worthy. <laughs> Faith, cuz, you're excellent. Mr. Worthy has not been faithful to his wife a single day of their marriage. <laughs> of course not. But that's no measure of a man's constancy. Then what is? His faithfulness to his mistress. He was never faithful to you. Mm, but he may be faithful to you. Well, why do you think so? I, I'm sure I'm not so handsome as you. Kissing goes by favor. He likes you best. He's not my husband. And thank your stars for that. For I never knew any husband that deserved the honor of the title. Are we returned to this? I cannot believe my loveless capable of such a betrayal. You want proof. I do not want it. You need it. I defy it. What if you could see her? Ugh, hang her, dirty troll. Do you know, cousin, I really believe she's so ugly she'd cure me of my jealousy. All the men in town say she's handsome beyond measure. <clears throat> men of sense, there's no such thing. Come, sweet cuz. Really, I am too much your friend to suffer. You should be thus grossly imposed upon by a man who, do who does not deserve the least part of you. Therefore, in one word, to my certain knowledge, your husband is to meet his mistress within a quarter of an hour at that Babylon of wickedness, Whitehall. And if you'll give me your word that you'll be content with seeing her masked in his hand without chopping the lady's head off, I'll step immediately to my informant and send you word whereabouts you may stand to see them meet. If you can do this, Berinthia, he's a villain. I can't help that. Men will ever be so. Well, I'll follow your directions for I shall never rest until I know the very worst. Exeunt severally. Enter fashion meeting Lori. Well, sir, will the doctor come? Presently, sir. He does not suspect his eye that sent for him. Not a jot, sir. He divines as little for himself as he does for his parishioners. Will he bring the nurse with him? Yes. And where's Coupler? Here, sweet fashion, with the others behind me. Enter Coupler, followed by the nurse and bull. When the nurse sees fashion, she starts. Oh, goodness, Roger, we are betrayed. The nurse and bull attempt to flee the room, but Lori slams the door behind them. <laughs> nay, nay, never flinch for the matter, for we have you safe. Come to your trials immediately. I have no time to give you copies of your indictment. There sits your holy judge above our heads. The nurse and bull fall to their knees. Pray, sir, have pity on me. I am an aged woman. And I am heaven's ambassador. Zunes, then you must be a criminal. Hush, fool. Mr. Bull, did you not marry, did not you marry this vigorous young fellow to a young country wench? Hmm? Don't confess, Roger, unless they torture you. Oh, now there's an idea. Hush. Come, nurse, you and I were better friends when we saw one another last, and I still believe you are a very good woman in the bottom. I did deceive you and your young lady, it is true. But I always designed to make a very good husband to her and be a very good friend to you. And tis possible in the end she might have found herself happier and you richer than ever my brother will make you. Brother? Why is your worship my lord Foppington's brother? I am, which you should have known if I durst have stayed to told you, but I was forced to take horse a little in haste, you know. You were indeed, sir, a poor young man. Now won't your worship be angry if I confess the truth to you? What truth? Mary, sir, t'was only because I discovered you were a cheat and a liar that I bid my mistress marry again. Upon my soul, Miss Hoyden had no taste of freedom at all till she was a wife. 
deprived as she was of one husband, I thought myself bound to keep her out her cage by securing her another. I begin to perceive, madam, you harbor some compassion for this young fellow. Great compassion, sir. Why then, I'll tell you what you shall do for me. You know Miss Hoyden was mine first and is, if, if I do speak it, mine in affections, just as I am in hers. Then if you and Mr. Bow will agree to prove my marriage before God and my brother, I will bequeath you the greatest living in Miss Hoyden's dowry and secure you a furnished abode should the day arise you twain choose to bind yourselves in matrimony. Now the blessing of the Lord follow your good worship both by night and day. I'll do it, dear sir, never fear. And so will I upon my honor. Oh, well said, old wit leathers. Come away, coupler. Let us put our resolutions into practice that I may finally claim my wife. And I my reward. And I my parson. And my brother's humility. Exeunt. Enter Amanda, Solus. At last, I am convinced. My eyes are testimonies of his falsehood. The base, ungrateful, perjured villain. Good gods, what slippery stuff are men composed of. Sure, the account of their creation's false, and twas the woman's rib that they were formed of. But why am I thus angry? This poor relapse should only move my scorn. Tis true, the roving flights of his unfinished youth had strong excuses from the plea of nature. Reason then threw the reins loose on his neck and slipped him to unlimited desire. If therefore he went wrong, he had a claim to my forgiveness and I did him right. But since the years of manhood reigned him in and reason well digested into thought has pointed out the course he ought to run, if now he strays, twould be as weak and mean in me to pardon as it has been in him to offend. But hold, my beauty possibly in, is in wane. Perhaps 16 has greater charms for him. Yes, there's the secret, but let him know my quiver is not entirely emptied yet. I still have darts I, and I can shoot them too. They're not so blunt, but they can enter still. The want's not in my power, but in my will. Enter worthy. Ha! Huh. My arrow here. Protect me, heaven, for this looks ominous. You seem disordered, madam. I hope there's no misfortune happened to you. None that will long disorder me, I hope. And might I ask what is the thorn torments you? Forgive me if I grow inquisitive, tis only with desire to give you ease. Alas, this thorn cannot be drawn out without a world of pain. If tis the sting of unrequited love, remove it instantly. I have a balm will quickly heal the wound. You'll find the undertaking difficult. The surgeon who already has attempted it has much tormented me. Who is he? I think you know. I fear I do. Pray, how would you advise me, Mr. Worthy? Selfishly, madam, for I would tell you to slight your God if he neglects his angel. With arms of ice receive your husband's cold embraces and keep your fire for those who come to you in flames. Behold, a burning lover at your feet, his fever raging in his veins. See how he glows, how he consumes. Extend the arms of mercy to his aid. His zeal may give him title to your pity, although his worthiness cannot claim your love. <laughs> of all my feeble sex, sure, I must be the weakest. Should I again presume to think on love? And yet... Your broken heart deserves a softer usage. But where's that usage to be found? Where indeed? Tis an honest question. Nay, madam, do not play the coquette with me. We both know you are above such tawdry games. 
And yet I have heard, Mr. Worthy, you are heartily inclined to coquettes. Not half so much as I am inclined to you. Ah, then spoke the libertine. You doubt the sincerity of my affection? Not at all, merely the singularity of it. You may love me today, tomorrow it will be another. God's my life, it is inimitable, madam. Only show me how I can make proof of it. There is on earth but one way. If it be in my power, it is done. Tell me then, what will convince you of my love? I shall believe you love me as you ought, if from this moment you forbear to ask whatever is unfit for me to grant. You pause upon it, sir. I suppose on such hard terms, a woman's heart is scarcely worth the having. A heart like yours on any terms is worth it. It was not on that I paused, but rather I was thinking whether there may be some things which women cannot grant without a blush, and yet which men may take without offense. Your hand, I fancy, may be of the number. Worthy takes Amanda's hand and kisses it. No, sir, let me go. Never, whilst I have strength to hold you here. He forces her to sit beside him on a couch. My life, my, my soul, my, 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 <laughs> my life, <laughs> my life, my soul, my goddess. Oh, forgive me. Let me go, sir. Help heaven or I am lost. Stand neutral, gods. This once I do invoke you. Then save me virtue and the glory's thine. Nay, never strive. I will, and conquer too. My forces rally bravely to my aid. Whilst mine as bravely double their attack. They struggle, Amanda to get away, worthy to keep her beside him. Come, deny me not, for all's in vain. On death or victory I am determined. And so am I. With her free hand, Amanda slaps Worthy across the face. His grip slackens, and she pulls away. Now keep your distance, or we part forever. For heaven's sake! Nay, then, farewell. Oh, stay, and see the magic force of love. Behold this raging lion at your feet, struck dead with fear and tame as charms can make him. What must I do to be forgiven by you? Repent, and never more offend. Repentance for past crimes is just and easy, but to sin no more is a task too hard for mortals. Yet those who hope for heaven must use their best endeavors to perform it. Endeavors we may use, but flesh and blood are got in the other scale, and they are wondrous things. Whatever they are, a weight in resolution sufficient for their balance. The soul, I do confess, is usually so careless of its charge, so soft and so indulgent to desire, it leaves the reins in the wild hand of nature, who, like a phaeton, drives the fiery chariot and sets the world on flame. Yet, still, the sovereignty is in the mind whenever it pleases to exert its force. Perhaps you may not think it worth your while to take such mighty pains for my esteem, but that I leave to you. You see the price I set upon my heart? Perhaps tis dear, but spite of all your art, you'll find on cheaper terms we ne'er shall part. Exit Amanda. Hmm. Sure, there's divinity about her, and she's dispensed some portion on it to me. For what but now was the wild flame I lo of love or rather the vile, the gross desires of flesh and blood, is in a moment turned to adoration. The course her appetite of nature is gone, and tis me thinks the food of angels I require. How long this influence may last, heaven, may, heaven knows. But in this moment of my purity, I could on her own terms accept her heart. Yes, lovely woman, I can accept it. Your charms are much increased since thus adorned. 
How strange is love to flourish where tis scorned. Exit Worthy. Enter Miss Hoyden and Nurse. But is it sure and certain, say you, that he's my lord's own brother? As sure as he's your lawful husband. Gad, if I had known that in time, perhaps I might have kept him. For between you and I, nurse, he'd have made a husband worth two of this idiot that I have. But which do you think you should fancy most, nurse? Why, truly, in my poor fancy, madam, your first husband is the prettier gentleman. Sure, anything is prettier than what I've got. What do you think my present husband puts me in mind of? Don't you remember a long, loose, shambling sort of a horse my father called Washy? Faith, Washy is as like to your Lord Foppington as two twin brothers. He got, I thought so a hundred times. Faith, I'm tired of him. Indeed, madam. I think you would even as good stand to your first bargain. Oh, but nurse, we hadn't considered the main thing yet. If I leave my Lord... I must leave my lady too. When I rattle about the streets in my coach, they'll only say, there goes mistress. Mistress. Mistress what? What is this man's name I have married, nurse? Squire Fashion. Squire Fashion, is it? Well, Squire. That's better than nothing, I suppose. But hark you me one more thing, nurse, and then I have done. I'm afraid if I change my husband again, I shan't have so much money to throw about. Oh, to have enough is as good as a feast. But I had rather have the feast. There is more than one appetite needs serving in a marriage, madam. What meanest thou? Had you rather be satisfied at the banquet table or in your bedchamber? Oh. My bedchamber, to be sure, and now I think on it. My Foppington promises to be most disappointing in that regard. Egad, he and I are never in conversation together, but I heartily wish him and his periwig exchanged for the face of that imposter, my first husband. <laughs> then tis decided. I'll be Lady Foppington no longer. That's fixed in plain. Oh, look, here he comes with all the fine folks at his heels. Egad, nurse, these London ladies will laugh till their painted faces crack to see me slip my collar and run away from my husband. Enter Foppington, leading Loveless, Worthy, Amanda, and Berinthia. Ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome. Uh, Loveless, that's my wife. Uh, Brithy, do me the favor to salute her. And do you hear, if thou hast a mind to try thy fortune with Hoyden to be revenged of me, I won't take it ill. Stop my vitals. You need not fear, sir. I'm too fond of my own wife to have the least inclination of yours. What a power of fine men there are in this London. He that kissed me first is a goodly gentleman, I promise you. Sure, these wives have a rare time on it that live here always. Enter, sir. Come in, come in, good people, come in. Come, tune your fiddles, tune your fiddles. Bagpipes, make ready there, come. Strug up. For oh, this is Oiden's wedding day, and therefore we keep holy day, and come to be merry. Ah, there's my wedding face. Touch and take, Lord Foppington. I warrant you'll breed like a tame rabbit. Egad, I think my father's gotten drunk before supper. Uh, Madam Amanda, Madam Berenthia, by your leave. <laughs> oh, they built like turtles. God, Zooks, they set my old blood afire. I shall cuckold somebody before morning. <laughs> Good father-in-law, you being master of the entertainment, will you desire the company to sit? Sit, sit, with all my heart. <laughs> a pox of ceremony, take your places, come. Come, let the musicians strike up a tune. We'll have dancing and on. The musicians play. The dancers perform a mask. Enter fashion, coupler, and bull. Oh, now, what have we got here? A ghost? <laughs> Nay. It must be so, for his flesh and blood could never have dared to appear before me. 
Hey, rogue. Uh, stop my vitals. Tom again? Uh, my Lord Foppington, will you cut his throat? Or shall I? Leave him to me, sir, if you please. Prithee, Tom, what's thy business here? Tis with your pride. Thou art the most impudent fellow that nature has yet spawned into the world. Strike me speechless. I have no choice but to be impudent, brother. If you, you know, my modesty would have starved me. I sent it a begging to you, and you would not give it a groat. And dost thou expect by an excess of vanity to extort a maintenance from me? I do intend to extort your mistress from you by this hand. Presumptuous scoundrel, thou belongst in a madhouse. <laughs> Prithee, Master Lovelace, dost know of any doctor hard by? There's one at your elbow who will cure you presently. Prithee, good Dr. Bull, take him in hand quickly. Shall I beg the favor of you, sir, to pull your fingers out of my wife's hand? His wife, look you there. Now I hope you all are satisfied he's mad. By the world, Tom, what species of folly art thou driving at? Here, here, let me beat his brains out and that will decide all. No, pray, sir, hold. We'll destroy him presently, according to the law. The law? Nay, then advance, good Mr. Bull. Come, you are a man of conscience. Answer boldly to the questions I shall ask. Did you not marry me to this young lady before ever that gentleman there saw her face? Since the truth must out, I did. Nurse, sweet nurse, were you not a witness to it? Since my conscience bids me speak, I was. Madam, am I not your lawful husband? Truly, I can't tell, but you married me first. Now, I hope you all are satisfied. Zooms and thunder, you lie! By all that's holy, sir, he does not. We speak the truth, heaven knows. Now, nay, prithee, never engage heaven in the matter, for by all I can see, tis like to prove a business for the devil. It's no use, brother, this young lady is my wife. I'll justify it in all the courts of England, and so your lordship, who always had a passion for variety, may go seek a new mistress. See, here's honest coupler shall be foreman, and ask as many question as he pleases. All I have to ask is whether nurse persists in her evidence. The parson, I dare swear, will never flinch from his. The nurse kneels at Sir Tenbelly's feet. I hope to heaven your worship will pardon me. I have served you long and faithfully, but in this thing I was overreached. Your worship, however, was deceived as well as I, for I mistook the young gentleman for his elder brother and thus did not mean to enact any harm to anyone, so I didn't. But how durst you do this without acquainting me of it? Alas, if your worship had seen how the poor girl begged and prayed and clung and twined about me like ivy to an old wall, you would say that I, who had suckled it and swaddled it and nursed it both wet and dry, must have had a heart of an executioner to refuse it. Deceit and treachery! Truth and undeniability. Foreman, I expect your verdict. Nay, let the Parliament carry it. Ladies and gentlemen, what's your opinion? A clear case. As clear as day. Clear as water. If the young lady has no objection. Egad, she does not. Well then, my young folks, I wish you joy. <sighs> Come hither, stripling. If it be true, then, that thou hast married my daughter. Prithee tell me who thou art. Sir, the best of my condition is that I am your son-in-law, and the worst of it is that I am brother to that noble peer there. Zones, why then, that noble peer, and thee, and thy wife, and the nurse, and the priest, may all go to hell and be damned together. Exit Sir Tunmully. Now, for my part, I think the wisest thing a man can do with an aching heart is to put on a serene countenance. I will therefore bear my disgrace like a great man and let the people see I am above an affront. Dear Tom, since things are thus fallen out, prithee, 
give me leave to wish thee joy. I do it, de bon guerre. Strike me dumb. You have married a woman beautiful in her person, charming in her airs, prudent in her conduct, constant in her inclinations, and of a nice morality. Split my windpipe. Your lordship may keep up your spirits with your grimace, if you please. I shall support mine with this lady and her 2,000 pound a year. Come, madam. We once again, you see our man and wife, and now perhaps the bargain struck for life. If I'm mistaken, we should part again. At least you see you may have choice of men. Nay, should the war at length such havoc make that lovers should grow scarce, yet for your sake, We'll find his lordship ready to come to. Her ladyship shall stop my vitals if I do. End of play. <laughs>